All right. Starting off this week with a question from Peter from Belfast. He's talking about flats versus climbing fitness. Uh, hi, greetings from Belfast. I love your podcast and I hope you can help me with a question. I'm a master's cyclist and a few years ago I decided to do structured training. I have seen great improvements in FTP, endurance, and climbing, but not on the flats. I'm still the first one dropped on the summer Tuesday evening chain gang. I don't understand why. Here's an example. I was racing a few months back on a hilly course. The last few kilometers consisted of four to five minute climbs, a short descent, and then a four to five minute flat gallop to the line. It all kicked off on the climb, but I was able to hang on reasonably comfortably and recover on the descent. But on the run to the line, the lead group rode me off their wheel. The power and hurry numbers were similar for the climb and the run in. So how can I hang on for the climb, but not for the fast run in, even though I was drafting? Is it cadence, low strength, or muscle fiber? Uh, no one can explain why, so I don't know how to fix it. I'm 82 kilograms, so how am I better on the hills than the flats? Next summer, I want to be staying with the group, not get dropped. Best, Peter. Um, so that Peter doesn't give us any context as far as what like his fitness level is. Um, Masters athlete. But yeah, Masters athlete, 82 kilograms, so he's not you know a featherweight. Yeah, um, 180. But I just did the math. Yeah. Um, and when I say featherweight, I mean like, you know, someone who comes in at 60 kilograms, you know, I mean, they're yeah. more, you know, uh, physique is more geared towards climbing. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm I mean, glad it is interesting. His, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad he put his weight in there because until he set his weight, I was assuming he was really small. Yeah. Because that's most really small people struggle with the exact same thing that he's talking about. They they hang in the group, no problem on the climbs, and then they struggle on the flats, which is usually, you know, it's not that common, but it is for really, really small people. Right. So, but he's not really small. He's, he's like, you know, pretty average which, sized, I'd say, if not. Yeah, which, um, you know, maybe, maybe that does give us a little bit more insight, though. You know, it's, it's possible that Peter's just not able to get very arrow with his position on the flats. Yeah. So on the climbs, when it's slower moving, it you know aerodynamics doesn't matter as much. But maybe on the yeah. flats, once the speed kicks up, uh, he's just not quite able to get into the draft uh, as well because his you know slipstream isn't quite as arrow. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like what are the differences if the power is the same on both, which he said the power and the heart rate are similar to both efforts. Well, then what are the things that are changing? And one is the speed, so the speed's going to affect the aerodynamics. And then the speed is also probably going to affect the rolling resistance of his tires. I'm assuming like the faster you go, doesn't that have something to do with your, like maybe he's running like too low of pressure or something. And so on the climbs, it's not that big of a deal, but on the, when the speed is higher, it affects it more. So, uh, I'm just, and I'm, those are the only two I've thought of so far, but <laughs> I'm trying to think of like, what are the other things drafting, you know, like drafting is eliminated on a climb. So, whether you're six inches or six feet from the guy in front of you or however, like it doesn't really make a difference. And so he says he's drafting, but I wonder if like maybe he's not drafting as good as he thinks he is or, or yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I, I also, he, he mentions cadence. Mm -hmm. Um, he also mentions leg strength or muscle fibers. Uh, I, I don't know if those are necessarily as relevant here because he does mention that yeah. he can put out the same power. But uh, right. let's say, let's say Peter, uh, a lot, it, everyone has kind of their own preferred cadence, but that doesn't mean that you're locked into that. Like you can change your preferred cadence through training. So let's say, because it sounds like Peter just started structured training a few years ago. Uh, let's say Peter's preferred cadence while climbing is... 75 to 80 rpms which would be kind of on the lower end but when you're climbing you know you can get away with a lower cadence uh if you're on the flats and your preferred cadence is lower like that you know 75 80 pretty much if your preferred cadence is cadence is under i would say upper 80s 87 to 90 rpms it's gonna be a lot harder to respond to accelerations on the flats so that could be something that's going on here. So if, if you know, if Peter's mm -hmm. chugging along at 75 RPMs, putting out 300 watts, 
and now all of a sudden he's got to kick up to 400 watts to respond to an acceleration, it's a lot harder to spin up that bigger gear than it is if your cadence is 90 and you're able to kind of like quickly turn over a little bit smaller gear. Um, you know, sprinters can attest to this. You know, you, you don't want to go into a sprint with a low cadence. You want to go into a sprint with a fairly high cadence so you can respond really quickly. Uh, so it, it, it could be something like that uh, that's going on here for Peter. Mm -hmm. What are some it, things you guys would recommend Peter try just to, uh, you know, either figure out what it, what the weakness is here or to just general generally make some improvements in riding the flats? I was thinking uh, when I'm afraid I'm going to get dropped on a climb, there's this thing that you can do. It's called you waterfall where you start, you, you move to the front of the group right before the climb because it's easier to move up on a flat usually than it is on a downhill or on a, uh, on a hill. And so you move to the front and then as you get to the climb, uh, you're going slower than everybody else. But because you went into the climb at the front of the group, you crest to the top of the climb at the back of the group. And so you've essentially just waterfalled your way from the front to the back and it helps you to pace yourself, but also not get dropped. And I'm, I'm almost wondering like if he could do that same thing, but on the flats, like position, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe part of it is like positioning. Like if he, if he could position himself better in the group, then that's uh, the closer you are to the front, the less yo-yos there are or the accordion effect where like when you go through a turn, uh, the gaps aren't opening and all that stuff. Like the closer you are to the front, yeah. the less of that, People talk about that all the time. Like it's easier to race at the front than the back because of that accordion effect. And so if he's always riding at the back and always having to sprint to catch up after every single turn, then I could see how that would be a factor as well. And so maybe uh, positioning a little bit better in that group could, could help. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and a couple of things that happen too, when you're riding at the back is, um, generally the people that are on the back are going to get spit off the back. You know, they're going to get dropped first before people that are in the middle or the front. So like mm -hmm. you're constantly having to close gaps of people in front of you that are also getting gapped. So like, it's pretty mm -hmm. risky too, to just ride at the back the whole time, because even, you know, taking that accordion effect out of, you know, out of the equation, just having to close those gaps of other riders that get shot off the back, uh, makes it super challenging. Um, yeah. but yeah, I think, I don't know. I wish I had a little bit more information to kind of gauge what's going on. Um, I, I still think it has to be something that's more uh, position related, um, you know, or, or just, you know, like you even talked about comfort riding in the pack, you know, how close is Peter getting when he's drafting off someone. Um, I just, I can't think that it's just fitness related. I, I mean, I think there's certain things that Peter could do to improve his ability to put out power, but he says he's putting out the same power. Um, I would certainly train more, you know, it's, it's, it's super yeah, common. Even for though, oh, even ahead. though he's, even though he's putting out the same power, he's drafting then at the same power. So sure. wouldn't that potentially mean that everyone has, is going a bit more chill than he is up the climb to like prepare for this run in. I don't know if that's their slang for like sprint to the line, but um yeah, it sounds like they're all going harder and he's just maintaining what he was able to do on the climb. So even mm -hmm. though he said he was able to recover on the descent, maybe he just doesn't have that ability, that um repeatability the and you know anything left in the legs to to go harder yeah. at that point so yeah. the good news is he's not sounds like he's not doing this until next summer so he has all winter to train and one thing i would suggest that he you know one good session um specific to this is one that i've talked about before one that you've given me adam called the lactate clearance workout so you're doing vo2 or um or threshold you can you can start there and then doing a short bout of vo2 or threshold and then immediately moving into extended time and tempo and then 
endurance, or if you were to start in threshold or VO2, then threshold, then tempo, and then recover. Um, so you're building no, that lactate. No recovery and, in between those intervals. You're going right, straight you're from your your uh, stair stepping it down mm -hmm. to the other. Yeah, with the hope that you're building that lactate in that first block, and you're forcing your body to to buffer that out. Um, yep. Yeah, and you can you can get really specific with those too. So, like, let's say Peter knows that uh, it's you know thirty second accelerations that are always gapping him off the back, and he's not able to recover from those. You can set this up to where you do you know thirty to sixty seconds of you know high VO two max or even anaerobic, and then settle back into tempo after that. Um, you know, or let's say it's, you know, three minute efforts that you're struggling with to recover from, then you can make it a three minute VO2 and then straight into tempo. You can kind of, you can switch up the structure to cater it to whatever the demands are that you're working towards. Um, but yeah, I like that. I like those workouts a lot because what it, what it forces you to do is, is exactly what happens in the group, which is like when you're at your limit, it forces you to like keep pushing, you know, it's. VO2 max workouts by themselves, you know, like if you're just doing VO2 max intervals, like they're hard, but you get to stop once the four minutes is up. What these teach you to do is, okay, you don't get the chance to stop. You know, you're going hard, you know, max effort for two minutes, and then you got to settle into tempo. And, uh, you know, it's it trains your body to to help buffer some of that lactate that's built up, but also just mentally forces you to hang on longer than you probably wanted to. And that's what's a lot of times it's the mental straw that breaks in, in races. You, it always seems like when, when you crack, you feel like you're the only one that is at the limit. But if you were to ask, like survey everyone in the group, probably 60 plus percent of the people are also at their limits. It's just like, what is that breaking point for each individual? You know, when are you going to, when are you willing to put up that white flag? Um, and sometimes it's like, you just have to hang on for another 10 seconds and then it, there's a little bit of a lull and it's like, okay, I made it through that, you know, little, um, you know, surge. Um, but the, these, these workouts I think are really good at training your, your mental aspect to hang on for some of those efforts. And you can do, you can do, um, sort of like an over under style too, where you do like two minutes on six minutes, tempo, another one minute on, and then another like four minutes of tempo or something like that, where it's like, you give a second acceleration where it's like, okay, then you're able to test and see, okay, did I actually buffer that lactate well? Like, can I do one more surge here and then hang on again? Um, and that kind of helps to like, uh, you know, when you're, you know, extending that, that po point where you, where the straw might break. I like it. Anyone else have anything to add there? Peter, I would also say, uh, do more of your structured intervals on flats. Uh, you know, if, if you're constantly going out, so I, mm. I, uh, Belfast is in Northern Ireland. So I'm guessing there's like a lot of these shorter rolling hills, you know, it's so like if you're going out and doing intervals, mostly on these shorter climbs, um, I would try and mix it up and do some of those same intervals on the flats. Um, and just, you know, work, work that, you know, if that's one of your weaknesses, you got to spend more time kind of focused on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm like thinking about what Caitlin said, like if you dial it back just a hair on the climb, then, you know, you're saving some energy for when you're on the flats. So then, yeah. So then you're not so gassed for the flats. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It could be a lot of different things. It could just be that he's used up all of his matches before they make it to the flat. And then, so he needs to work on his durability, but it could be something as easy as like, yeah, he's not arrow. So on a climb, you can be as un arrow as you want pretty much. But if you're yep. sitting straight up in the air in the middle of the group, like you're taking on way more wind than everybody around you, even if you are in the draft. So if you could like, you know, get a little lower or whatever, then that, that might help. Yep. But hard to say without, I don't know, without seeing it, I guess, or seeing him. Cool. All right, Peter. Well, good luck. Let us know mm -hmm. if uh, how it works out for you.
Uh, okay, this one comes from Michael. Michael says, hey guys, thanks for all of your work. Amazing to get to soak up all of your training knowledge. I'm going to be trying to up my volume a couple hours a week once I start up again after a small winter maintenance phase for 2024. For 2024, I was riding 11 to 14 hours a week, and I'll be trying to maintain 14 to 15 hours for 2025. I was chatting with a friend, a Cat 1 racer with 15 years of training. I myself have been structured training for only a couple years now. About my plan for the, for the days I work from home, uh, work from home days are all trainer rides, and how I put in an hour zone 2 before work, an hour zone 2 during lunch, and when I ramp up training in a month, I can do another hour after work. I would do this two days a week, usually Monday and probably Friday. I'll always have two intensity sessions a week that are prioritized. And with my schedule, I can always get a four to five hour zone two ride in every other Friday. Um, oh, and it mixes that up with cross country skiing in the winter time. Uh, my weekend is between four to eight hours of riding, depending on the season and how my fatigue level is. Here's my question. Whether those split zone two workouts, three, three a days, are exactly what I assume they are and just adding in as many extra hours TSS fatigue of riding as possible, even if it's a shorter session, or are they junk miles like my friend was politely suggesting because they were only an hour and they probably weren't doing anything um, and I should find a way to make it a two hour ride before work on those three a day splits and not even worry about the last one hour session. Uh, any thoughts on this split zone two day, three, out, three one hour sessions? Um, thanks, Michael. That's terrible. That sounds so bad. It sounds <laughs> unsustainable. Do those three a days twice a week for one week and you're going to be like, this is this is ridiculous just because it takes you got to get all your crap together, even if you're riding on the trainer, which is like the most time effective way to, to do this. Still, you got to get your stuff together. Yeah, I, I don't know. I we've talked I about disagree. laundry. I thought it was awesome. I'm like, dude, we've, I wish we've... I wish I was this committed to where I found every spare hour I had in my day, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna waste that hour. I'm gonna get on my trainer and train my butt <laughs> off. Like, but I feel like it... again, if you have only an hour, you know, there's a more effective way to use that hour. We've talked about splitting up a two hour endurance rides before and did two separate rides. And I'm pretty sure our conclusion was like two hours is definitely two consecutive hours is definitely better yeah. for a zone two ride than yeah. so Yeah, yeah, for sure. For three sure. one hour sessions. Right. No, I agree with that. If Dylan said that, that all over, yeah, yeah. If he's that disciplined to where he's willing to do three one hour sessions in a day then yeah you should totally figure out how to do so here's a the two question hour session before so would you take instead. one two hour session or three one hour sessions in a day three one hour sessions that's what that'd what be my the, answer too if what was because you end up because one, he didn't he didn't up rather with two, he'd end up yeah. with two extra hours of volume at the end of the week which if he's training less than 20 hours a week, that's over a 10% increase in volume right there just from those two hours. But it yeah. sounds like that's all the time he has. What if instead of three one-hour sessions, he ends up with the the two-hour session plus a strength workout during yeah. lunch? No, that would be better. I would... I, but he's still getting in the, to me, I still count the volume or the, I still count the time from the gym. So he'd still get in that scenario. He'd still get in three hours cause he'd get two on the bike and one in the gym. Um, so like that, I think that would be optimal is, is, but I don't know, he doesn't mention strength training. So I don't know if he's doing strength on those other days or what, but, uh, um, so, I mean, here's, yeah. here's my understanding of the situation is it doesn't sound like um, doing three hours a day with a two hour chunk is feasible. So it sounds like he can either do. Uh, he suggested. Yeah, I think he said he, to, said he could do. Yeah, he said he could do, do two, two in up. the morning, mm -hmm. one at lunch, and then just cut the one at the end of the day. Which I think uh, if, if, if those no, were the choices, it, it doesn't, it, so that's not what? the way that he, he says it. So it says 
should I find a way to make it a two hour ride before work and not worry about the last one hour session? So yeah, so he'd still so, do the lunch session. Two hours in the morning so. and one I, at lunch. I took it as he would just get the two hour session in. That's the way that I was oh. interpreting it. Because if if that's not the case, then yeah, obvious. Like do the two hour session and then a one hour session at lunch. Like that would be the obvious yeah, choice. That's what I was um, I'm guessing it's not that obvious or he wouldn't be asking the question. Oh. So so two hours in the morning or or three one hour sessions. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're that committed to do three one hour sessions, um, I'd go with that. But I before that, I would say if you can do two in the morning and one at lunch or one and add in a, either one at lunch or one later, I think three a day is like what Caitlin was saying. I like that she said that that's unsustainable because three workouts a day is a lot. So if you can minimize that down to two, but still get the same amount of volume, you're you're getting in the same amount of volume, but you're making it more sustainable, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with that. I I have had periods this last year where I've done like three a day sessions, but it was across different modalities. Like I'd go for mm -hmm. a run, I'd go to the gym, and then I'd go for yeah. a ride. That's what I was um, going to say. And I'll be the first to admit, like it's not, it's not very efficient. You know, like you think you're getting three hours of training with the three hours you have, but you're probably getting more like two hours and 15 minutes at the end of the day. Um, now if, if, if he's saying, if Michael's saying like he legitimately gets those three hours, great. But that means you probably had, you know, three and a half hours to work with, you know, like there's, there's, there's time in there. Like Caitlin's talking about, like there's time that you dedicate for each ride that contributes yeah. to your overall total time Just spent. Dude, we don't know if he's, he might be leaving his chamois on in between those rides. <laughs> what if he just leaves his oh. chamois on all day? Like to save some time. He's like, I could take this chamois off or I could leave it on and I can get another 15 minutes of training. Like, <laughs> hey, if that's the case. Good for him. Just wear yeah. swimming trunks I over, his, even, <laughs> over his chamois. Even just like the mental ass, like everyone knows, like you, you've had those times where it's like, all right, I'm going to start training in five minutes. And then before you know it, 15 minutes is up. And it's like, well, shoot, I just lost 10 minutes of training. Like, that's what I'm saying is like, it's really easy to let that time allocation slip. So, and I think the more sessions you have, the more susceptibility there is to like lose efficiency in that. Um, now, I would still say I would rather see an athlete do three hours a day than one two hour session. I think in this case, as long as it's as long as it's effective training, I think it's I think it's going to be better. Um, Dude, he's, well, I, he's already I, I getting enough a... long sessions. He says every other week he's getting a four hour ride on a Friday, and every weekend he's doing four to eight hours. So, like he's already hitting those longer rides where he's getting the like mitochondrial adaptation. So like I'm not that worried about that part of it. If his whole training makeup was this like three days every single day, and he was never getting more than an hour ride in that'd be a different story, but like he's already getting some of those longer rides and the rest of it is just contributing towards his aerobic base. Yeah. I look a lot at weekly volume. I mean, like for myself and for the athletes I coach, like I'm always looking at their weekly volume to see where they are, how much we can push that up to like what's sustainable, what can they average? And I mean, like in my own training personally, in, in college, I don't think I cared at all about uh, my volume, like weekly volume. And now it's probably like the, maybe it might even be the number one thing on my list of like, I want my weekly volume to be increasing. Sure. So if he's getting in, if this is the only way he can up that weekly volume, then I'm a fan for it. Yeah. And I, mean, I think we've had yeah. this discussion quality over quantity. And I think you want to increase the quality of your volume during the week. And three one hour zone yeah, it's two all zone sessions two, like just but it's almost like i hate to say this because i, I there's a time and a place to do like an two hour minutes isn't a short time let me let me finish <laughs> yeah i i disagree for zone two i think an hour is a short amount of time for zone two you go for a one hour zone two because run think it's about a like long time this is going to the other extreme talking about VO2, but like people think there's, I, and I agree, I think there's a time and a place to do like two to three minutes of VO2 and repeatedly, but like we can agree that you're not really at VO2 within two minutes. It's like six minutes. There's 
a physiological change that happens that you're actually in VO2. And I think the same principle kind of applies for, for zone two. An hour, to me, just feels like an hour of endurance. It's not, but it almost feels like it's just a recovery ride. And you want to do three hours of recovery in the day. But when you get to two hours at zone two, like now you're getting the proper adaptation from that. Two hours consecutive, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the state that you're in two hours into a two hour consecutive ride. An hour and would, 20, an hour and 30, an hour and. Right. Is going to yeah. be better. Is going to be better than the state that you're in after two separate one hour rides. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. So if you do, if you can make it work, take again, take that discipline that you had to do three one hour sessions and do one two hour session for those two days per week, you're only losing two hours and two hours that aren't r really quality that do kind of feel like junk miles like your friend was talking about. And now you have two extra hours. So like think about just the difference in your day and your mindset. Your ride is done before work. Now you don't have to get on the trainer at lunch. You don't have to get on the trainer after work. Yeah, can, but that's you're that's more if, willing that's to if you don't like riding enjoy your, bike, your lunch Caitlin. and do a short a short <laughs> strength session. Like but if this just, guy just loves like the, the that one hour lunch session on the trainer is what gets him through work. He's like, oh, I can't wait to I got to knock out this spreadsheet, whatever, so that I can <laughs> hop on the trainer for an hour. I can relate. I've been there. Yeah, I I, I kind of agree with that. I would say this this would be it. If I could rewrite Michael's schedule here, and I don't know if this is something that he would be into, but I would do what Kaylin's talking about, pushing that two hour, pushing that morning ride to two hours, and then Agreed. I would do either a strength session or just go for like a thirty minute run. Yeah. Like if you if you can't fit in a full hour in the afternoon, mix it up and do something different. You know, go yeah. for go for that half hour run. That's what I. That's probably exactly what I would suggest as well. Let's let's like switch it up to where you're doing two different things um but still trying to get in the total same amount of volume yeah or close to it like you said yeah like a half hour run to me is pretty equivalent to an hour ride as far as the training load yeah yeah i agree but i like i mean i <laughs> like the guy for like, I, I don't know that many people that do three a days. I, I'm doing a lot of two a days right now because I'm doing I'm I've added running and strength into my like off season training. So like more days than I'm not, I'm doing two a days. I'm doing some kind of gym or run in the morning and then riding later. Yeah, uh, but to up that to three sessions a day would be a lot. You know, like that's three different times to the like, Caitlin's point. That's three different times that I'm having to like think about working out, get, getting ready to work out, trying not to sweat too much on the first one so that I don't have to take a shower. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, I don't want to take three showers a day. Um, yeah, it's a waste of time. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, from experience, it is a lot. And for me, like I, I mostly did it because it was fun. Like I liked mixing it up and I wanted to do these different activities in the day. But like looking back on it, I for sure would have been way fitter if I had just done like a three hour ride. Yeah. Which like I could have done, like my, my <clears throat> schedule could have afforded that. Like I, I had the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, it just wasn't as fun for me, but I also didn't really care about performance this past year. Whereas Michael's trying to improve, you know, he's trying to figure out what way can he get better. Um, and that would, you know, yeah, it. I, 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 I do agree with Caitlin. I, I think the sustainability of this and the expectation that you're going to get exponentially better because of it, um, might not be met. It just sounds crazy to say in two days, you can have six bike sessions or two. <laughs> he's got a, I know he's got a, full, just think he's going to have laundry, a, dude. yeah, his laundry basket is going to be full. <laughs> That's six dirty chamois. <laughs> Yeah, we we hope it's six thirty. Shannon, not two. <laughs> no, I've thought about this myself because um, I've like I really want to like like yeah, like I said, like I'm always trying to look for ways that I can increase my volume because um, you know it's crazy how this happens in life. But like when I had all the time in the day 
I didn't have the motivation to train as much as I do now. And now I have the motivation to train like tons of hours, but now I don't have the time to do it. And so I've thought like, I've thought a lot, like, I think something I'll start to implement going into 2025 is because I could get up and do 90 minutes to two hours on the trainer before my kids wake up. And so I could get in that extra volume there and still go for my afternoon ride. Um, but then my afternoon ride doesn't have to be like this super long ride. It can be like a medium length ride because I've already knocked out two of those hours, which is just, it's just helpful for my family. If I'm not gone for like half the day on my bike, if I'm gone for, if I can get some of that training in when everybody else is asleep, that's better if for, you know what I mean? So I've even thought about having to implement that once I get more into training for 2025. Yeah, or if I were you, I would get up and do like your intervals if you can in the morning. On the trainer? Yeah. Bro, not going to happen. <laughs> I only or, do or my go intervals for, outside. Or go for a run, do a 45 yeah. to 60 minute run, you know? Like, I'm just trying yeah, to I'm think of like. I'm already doing that. Because yeah. to, to, to get up two hours early, like, you're probably going to be cutting into some sleep and recovery yeah. there. So, like, if there's a True. way you could reduce that to closer to an hour. Yeah. Yeah, so, right, now I'm, right now I'm doing my. Go ahead. I was going to say, he's going to be getting better sleep, potentially having not worked out in the middle of the day and then also in the evening. Oh, right. Are we talking this about guy. Drew or Michael? No, no, this guy. No, now we're talking about Michael. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I think not working out <laughs> in the... I was talking like, about Drew. Sorry, I'm I do, still thinking about Yeah, that. no, I do think that working out in the evening is detrimental to sleep. Like, I, if it's too late into the day, like past mm-hmm. 6 p.m., and I haven't got on my bike yet, I at that point, it's like... If I get on my bike, I'm not even going to get off till 7 or 8 p.m. And then it's like, that's just, it's just not going to be good for sleep. But yeah, I already do. Like to what you said, Adam, I'm already like every morning, I'm either running or doing a gym workout and riding in the afternoon. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Sweet. Well, this last one here is just a shout out, I think. I don't know. Nice. Robert even listen, Coach Robert Sroka, does he listen to our podcast? And I've begged him to come on to the podcast, but he <laughs> well, won't do it. Anyways, uh <laughs> he's one of his probably athletes, one of our <laughs> smartest coaches. One of one of our one of his athletes, Ronald, says, not a question, but a cool interaction with my coach. Last year nice. I wanted to meet up with Robert to do a gravel race together, uh, just to be at the same event and hang out, but plans just didn't work out. Yesterday it was raining, so I pl- so I hopped on Zwift to do a zone two workout. Robert texted me some suggested routes. I was on Zwift for about 15 minutes when in pops Robert. We quote unquote rode together for over two hours. For some, riding with their coach isn't uncommon, but with Robert living pretty far away, it was a really cool experience. Like on the same level, if I got to go ride with one of you on the podcast. If any of y'all have the chance to join your athletes, it could really brighten their day and it's a neat way to interact with each other. Plus, Training Peaks just acquired Indie Velo, which is their new like Training Peaks virtual. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that could be cool. So I just thought that was a cool little tidbit feedback. Um, nice. When I Good think job, of like Robert. virtual riding with people, I guess I've, I've just never really gotten into the virtual riding thing. Yeah. Um, I've never thought about the fact that like it, if you're riding with like your coach on the virtual world, like that could be a fun interaction, I guess. We were talking to this company for like a, for a long time that wanted us to use their platform called Velocity think it still exists um yeah same kind of idea but instead of it just being totally virtual it's like and instead of it being on zwift it was on its own platform and it was like your coach would lead a ride so like if robert was leading a ride he could invite all of his athletes or all of the ignition athletes to join in and for this workout and robert would like talk to them and interact with them and he can and they can speak to him like he he can see all the people on their screens if they want to like share access to their to their camera or whatever. Um, and I thought that would kind of be cool if you know it's, it's kind of like a virtual spin class. Exactly, that's the way I thought about that's, it. Yeah, that's the way. Yeah, but which I, I thought that was cool. If we seem... could all get like Britney microphones and yeah, you know, yeah. yeah I literally had I had music. the <laughs> yeah. They sent me one. It was like one of the ones that it looked totally like the Britney microphone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think it just didn't work out because we, none of our coaches have enough time to dedicate to doing the virtual spin class. I think that's what it boiled down to is like, yeah, that's a lot to ask. 
but maybe I maybe like I should concept. maybe I should do it and I can just set up three one hour zone two rides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> join me for my morning session, my lunch session, <laughs> and my afternoon session. <laughs> I I good. um, I mean, my training volume has been super low all year, but it's like really low right now. Uh, and I've been considering doing like two a day, like what what is it called, the Norwegian method, like two a day. Mm intensity rides like threshold days um threshold. so maybe maybe i'll uh maybe i'll do that maybe i should do the virtual two-hour virtual but you rides. still only do that two days a week but you're just doing two intensity sessions on those two days a week or even just one day a week it's it's pretty much like what how can i train less but still be kind of fit <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah that's great um lately i've been I going wish. out i've been I doing wish. like 30 minute interval rides you just go out hammer some intervals for 30 minutes and then come home wow takes yeah. you long according to caitlin it takes you longer to put your chamois on so it's just not even worth it it's just <laughs> especially not worth when it it's cold out dude yeah it's like extra layers <laughs> yeah. yeah all right yeah let's uh let's wrap it up thanks guys right. come on guys all right we'll see you